You know, Bill Buckley always said that, he said, conservatives don't need to have just a conservative news channel or outlet. They just need balance and to have both sides because the public will usually 80% of the time pick the conservative side when they're given an equal disposition of both sides. And I think that Newsmax tries to do that. We try to give both sides and, and let people decide themselves. My guest today is Chris Ruddy. Chris is founder and CEO of Newsmax Media, one of the nation's leading news media companies. A Newsweek cover story named him as one of America's top 20 most influential news media personalities. He started Newsmax in 1998 with a $25,000 investment, along with the owner of the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, where Chris worked as a national correspondent. Today, Newsmax TV is one of the fastest growing news sites with more than 30 million views per month. Since the November elections, Newsmax's popularity has been surging and has even made a dent in Fox News' ratings. I recently sat down with Chris and talked about why he started Newsmax and how he sees the media landscape playing out over the next few years. Chris, thanks so much for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I really look forward to our, our discussion today when I heard that you're coming on the show because I have so many things I want to speak to you about. Charles, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Okay. First thing I want to ask you, Chris, you started out in 1998 with $25,000. Uh, you were correspondent at the time. How did you even come up with the idea of a Newsmax? Well, I had been a journalist in the 90s. I saw the um, I saw how liberal the media was and uh, how uniform they were in their thinking. What we're facing today is not really completely new. And uh, saw the power of the Internet take off, uh, saw the success of things like the Drudge Report. And I thought, you know, there really needs to be more more voices, not less. So I started Newsmax.com. We've had phenomenal success. We're one of the major conservative sites. We were back then. We still are. We've launched now a cable TV news channel, and um, and people get our news from emails. They download our free app, which is on every smartphone. We had about five million people download the app uh, since um, since election day last year, which is an amazing number. So back in '98, you saw a need. Uh, that was uh, um, a, a period of time where the internet wasn't so ubiquitous. It was out there, it was in the early stages. It was just a few years away from AOL uh, being the internet. So we were starting to get, I remember 56K, we were still using 56K back in my office uh, uh, in 98. And did you always see Newsmax when you first started out? Did you see it as an online service, an online news media service? Was that your first uh, uh, um, uh, vision of how you saw that you had disseminated information? Well, Newsmax has started as an internet news company, but the internet's gone on to take a lot of different meanings. Back in 98, there wasn't even a Wi-Fi. Now everybody uses Wi-Fi uh, to communicate. And Wi-Fi has been an incredible uh, development for television and, and OTT television that's come about. Newsmax, we eventually go on to cable systems across the country. We're on every major cable system with our cable TV channel. Uh, but we now are the only really big cable news channel on the OTT devices. And I'm talking about uh, Pluto, Zumo, YouTube Live, Roku. Um, and there's, you know, people forget there's now 125 million TV homes in America. It used to be most of them had cable. Now only about 80 million plus have cable. The rest, 45 million, get their, get their television through either broadcast over the air or through OTT, through their smart TVs. Newsmax is the only one sort of offering a free stream on their smart TVs. That's a traditional cable news channel. Fox is behind a paywall and MSNBC. So it shows you where the internet has gone. I would have never thought we would be a TV broadcaster in 45 million homes uh, or over 100 million smartphones, but we are. What I find fascinating about Newsmax, and we'll talk about the politics in just a second and, and, and where you fit into that, is how you started a news service when there were the giants back in the day, there was ABC, NBC, CBS, there were the networks. 
there were major news organizations throughout the world uh, that uh, you weren't even a, a David. You know, Goliaths were all around. There was extreme, Rupert Murdoch. The media, how does one break into that business? Well, now it's become a lot more easier, a lot more fragmented. Think about people that have started podcasts that have become overnight sensations with social media. I think a lot of the barriers are down. What's happened is the big media companies have multiplied uh, multiply the outlets they're in. Uh, and then you've had big tech, which controls the gates or the channels, and they're trying to lock down certain, certain media outlets or people. We've seen the president recently deplatformed from both Facebook and Twitter. Um, so it does present problems, even if you're, if you're an alternative media source now. But you know, when Fox started in the 90s, nobody knew or heard the names Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity. And they became soon very, very important on the media landscape. Now Newsmax, a lot of people hadn't heard about Newsmax TV until election day. Now we're the fourth largest cable news channel in the United States. If you take Fox Business and CNBC and combine them, typically our ratings are higher. And we're taking at any given day part about a third to a half of Fox News's audience, which is a mammoth audience. So we're taking a huge chunk of that and continue to do it. So it just proves, Charles, that somebody can come in if you have a vision of where you want to go and you have really good content. Uh, people will, in this day and age, be attracted to it. Yeah, but, you know, it seems like an overnight su success for Newsmax and you since November of uh, 2020. But this was 20 plus years in the making, yeah? We've been around for a while. Yeah, and we're known for our Newsmax.com. I mean, last month, 16 million people went to Newsmax.com. We did a couple of hundred million page views. We're one of the top internet news sites. But we now have an app people are going to. We have cable channels that people are going to. We're really hitting people. Again, I think it's the big media companies figured this out. You want to hit people at all the levels that they're interacting with the media, not just through one narrow channel. And uh, we're going to continue adding to those uh, areas where people can can get Newsmax, whether it be podcasts, radio, and other areas. So, what is why? How is Newsmax standing out now and gaining market share? And and especially since November uh, twenty twenty. Uh, and you have so many more millions of viewers and, and people who are now reaching out and trying to find Newsmax. What is it that your organization offers the public that they're saying, you know what, the traditional ways I'm out, I like this? Well, one quick way people can see the difference is you go to Newsmax.com right now, you look up the stories that we're covering and the way we're approaching news, and you look up FoxNews.com. You get an idea, for instance, how we're different from the largest competitor in the field. I think most people out there in the heartland would like Newsmax if they got to know us more. And certainly people that have checked it out are going to us, I think, more than they're going to Fox these days. Wait, give me an example. Give me an example. I'm sorry, Chris. I'm, I, go, I do what you just said. I go on and I watch the way Fox covers and you cover. What am I seeing that's different that's saying, you know what? Well, There's a well let's, let's just look, at Charles, at a recent story, which was the election of Joe Biden. When that election took place, uh, it was a very close race. Uh, only about a, probably less than 100,000 votes divided the winner from the loser, Joe Biden and the president. But the president decided to challenge Biden in six states where the result was 1% or less. Two of the states, it was a half a percent. One of the states, Georgia, was a quarter percent difference. These are very close races. So Newsmax's position at that time was, we are going to call those states as they certify. And in each case, they certified Biden, we called them. But we said the president's challenging these, one of the contestants. In the 2000 election, when Al Gore said, hey, wait a minute, he actually conceded and then withdrew his concession. And he said, I'm not going to concede now. I want to challenge it. Everyone in the media said, we're not going to call this till Al Gore admits that he's over which took till mid-December and everybody stood down. You had a very similar situation where you had close races in six states. We said, we're, we're gonna wait. Uh, Fox News immediately called most of the states for Biden that were contested, including Arizona. They called it within an hour or so of the polls closing. 
with only less than 20 percent of the vote. It made no sense. They wouldn't call California, Florida, which the President Trump had won very handily and that they had the results for hours. It was a very strange situation. They called um, uh, Biden the president elect within a few a week or two of the election. Uh, our view was that he should only be called president elect in a contested race while it was being challenged until the day of the Electoral College, which was December 14th. When that happened, we did it. We played it by the book. We didn't actually take sides. We played it by the book. And Fox didn't. Fox seemed to be playing it against the president. And so we're, even to this day, if you watch Fox, they don't talk about Donald Trump generally on their shows. He's a non-important figure. Uh, Newsmax thinks that he's still a very significant player in the Republican Party and American politics. Why do you think Fox got it wrong? I don't know, but I think Fox is an old brand and it's pretty stale and it's starting to show it's been around for a long time. Uh, I, I don't think the country, if you go into a supermarket and there was only one type of cereal, you would think, well, what's going on here? Why aren't there more types of cereal? And for Fox to control all of sort of right of center thinking in the United States for television, I think it's dangerous when the left and the left of center has so many choices and options. Uh, it's not good for the country for that to happen. It's not good for the competition of ideas. And so Newsmax has come in. We've taken a very significant market share. Uh, we've been successful as a business doing it. Um, and people are tuning in. So I think, you know, I haven't delved into the autopsy on Fox News. I think everybody has their own opinion, but a lot of people think they've gone more establishment over time. So they sold out. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I think they've been lack, they lacked a certain consistency. You know, when you watched CNN or MSNBC, it was anti-Trump all the time, wall to wall. And as you got close, close to the election, any little disagreements or criticisms of, uh, of the left's position vis-a-vis -vis Trump was not even allowed. If you went to Fox, they had a lot of criticism. They even confirmed the story that Donald Trump had said that uh, the dead soldiers in Europe were, were suckers and losers. They confirmed that as true. And I think it's generally viewed as a phony fake story that was anonymous sourced. And even General Kelly's chief of staff uh, said that it was not true and that the president had not made those comments. Uh, and I think that, that again, was very typical of, of what we're seeing at Fox. Um, and, and I think that lack of consistency developed a lot of anger that people saw uh, that really burst open on election night. So... Why is it that people are looking towards Newsmax and saying, you know what, I believe this? Because news is basically, the way the news media works, it's a belief system. And you have to believe the credibility uh, behind that. Because you're, you know, I, I agree 100% with you that, uh, you know, what things come off as fact that are in fact, the danger is already done when it's presented as such. Uh, so people are extremely concerned now of what is real, what is not real, why are they honing in and saying Newsmax is real? Um, we always say we're real news for real people. We're covering, I think Newsmax, I come out of journalism. I worked at the New York Post. I worked for Rupert Murdoch, and then I worked for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. I've been at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And I have more of a fact-based fact approach to television and journalism. Um, even if it includes opinion, it needs to be opinion that's backed by fact. You know, um, the, the, the Fox network was started by Roger Ailes, who was a TV genius, but his real background was in politics as a political strategist. And he, had, he ran Fox as a campaign, which led to its success, but it really was like a political campaign. And I think that you still see the over, overtones of that in its, in its news reporting that uh, I think separates Newsmax uh, from Fox. Um, even on some of this election disputed stuff that took place, our hosts were much more reserved and restrained about saying that certain software was manipulated or something like that, where the Fox hosts were uh, much more aggressive in saying things that seem more political rather than fact-based. So, so 
with Newsmax now gaining a foothold, right? You're, you're now establishing a real big beachhead. It took you a long time to get there. It, November really was a tipping point where you just went off to the moon here. Uh, what's keeping you up at night in terms of the next Chris Ruddy out there who's trying to knock Newsmax off? I'm not really up late at night worrying about that. I, uh, you know, there, the, there's an immense moat around getting into cable and OTT news. Uh, it is very expensive uh, to do. Murdoch spent uh, billions of dollars to build Fox News. I will have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to build Newsmax TV. Uh, but to, to start it and then to have success at it is a very difficult thing. And um, I'm not really, I don't think that many people are going to put up money. Uh, we are on every major cable system now, DirecTV, Dish, Fios, Comcast, Xfinity, um, Spectrum. And to get on those systems, I think we're really the last cable, new cable channel to get on. So if some group wanted to get a new channel, I think it'd be difficult. Um, and it's just not easy. And I think you have to have a certain talent. We put it together. Some really good people. Uh, Greg Kelly has been our star at night. Uh, we've added to the lineup. Sean Spicer and Lindsey Keith are doing a great job at 6 o'clock. I think they have a very innovative, interesting show about Washington. 8 o'clock, uh, Grant Stinchfield from Texas. I think he gives a real heartland perspective. Rob Schmidt, who comes formerly from Fox, uh, is doing an incredible job at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, with a breakdown of the day's news. So a lot of it's personality and getting people, a lot of our folks come from a journalistic background, which again, separates us uh, from some of the Fox folks. But I, I think, you know, again, all I can say is tune in and look and see if you like it. If you don't, go back to Fox or MSNBC or CNN. So Chris, you're a smart guy. Uh, you built something which is amazing in a 20 year plus span. If you're sitting in the boardroom now of Fox and you're seeing you guys coming in and starting to gain market share, more engagement, I know that you, your, your subscriber base or your viewer base is a very engaged uh, um, viewer base, especially more conservatives really suck up news in a way that the average human doesn't. Uh, they really become engaged with your shows. And you are right. Uh, uh, well, I should say you're right. I happen to agree with uh, your your. Um, your um, hosts are extremely engaging. And full disclosure, I was on one of those shows uh, being interviewed. Really engaging, really up with it, looking at news in a different way. My question is this. Uh, if you're sitting in the boardroom of Fox right now and you're trying to gain back some of this market share, what are you doing? Well, uh, one thing is I'm not sitting in that boardroom and I wouldn't presuppose to, uh, to start giving them advice on how they should be handling their own network. I can say as an outsider that I think that Fox has a current trajectory in one direction, which is down, and it's not, it's not going to be a rosy future. And it's not just because of Chris Ruddy at Newsmax. I think that the internet and the cord-cutting world has been, will be very deleterious. It already has. I mean, I remember 15, 20 years ago, Charles, you've been following media. Fox used to be in 100 million cable homes. I think the latest report is 82, 83 million cable homes. And uh, some of those subscribers, not as strong as your traditional television. There are people that do it on the internet and things. So they have, their position has weakened. It will continue to weaken. Uh, the OTT answer they have, which is Fox Nation, I don't think has been a very clever, ultimately will prove a very smart move for them in the OTT world where there's so many cord cutters. Newsmax hurts them on several levels because A, we are taking a significant market share and you see it in a thing called the Nielsen coverage rating, which is uh, shows uh, the number of cable homes we penetrate proportionate to theirs. And that's showing that we're taking a big chunk daily of their numbers in, in key day parts. But the big thing is that people don't have to subscribe and pay $2,000 a year for cable anymore because they can just get a Roku box for $40 a year and get Newsmax TV for free 
And I think our quality is as good or better than Fox News. So why would you spend any more of the money anymore? And we have very similar guests. I think we have sometimes better guests and better analysts uh, that are coming out. For example, I think we have the two best political analysts in the United States, Dick Morris, who's worked for presidential candidates. He even has advised Trump. And Doug Schoen on the Democratic side, who's very famous. He's He used to be a Fox. They're both now our key political analysts. Alan Dershowitz is on Newsmax much more than he's on Fox News. Alan, I think, is the premier legal analyst in the United States. He's with us. He's a contributor to Newsmax. Uh, so you go through and you're like, well, why am I paying $2,000 a year largely to watch Fox News? It doesn't make any sense. So Newsmax now becomes a better alternative and you can stream us for free on your phone app or whatever. And so Fox and getting back to that corporate, they don't really have a plan. Um, uh, Mr. Murdoch, uh, who founded Fox, I think is one of the greatest giants in media history. I'm a great admirer of his. But he is 90. I think they have to be thinking about succession. There was a story in the Financial Times just a week ago, and it's a very interesting story. It said that Lachlan, his son, uh, eldest son, is uh, running Fox. And, and Lachlan's um, a conservative, I believe, and a good guy. But he's apparently not that engaged in the business. And then your other, his other son, James, is very liberal. Apparently, the two sisters side more with him. Uh, when they think about Fox News. In the article, it said that James and the sisters, when Rupert passes, that they don't want to sell Fox. They want to change Fox and make it more establishment. I'm paraphrasing here, but that was in the article. So anybody that's a big supporter of Fox and you're, you're, you're conservative, you've got to worry about the future of Fox. And the tea leaves suggest it's not always going to be uh, as politically to the to the to the right as it has been in the past. Where would you put Newsmax on that? Where would you, uh, you know, we, we talk all about right and left and center. I don't know where the center is anymore. Where would you position Newsmax in terms of reporting? Well, it's interesting. When I started Newsmax, I was saying back six years ago, we are center right was how I described us, which was not a term widely used in the media. And I noticed that it's used widely, and Fox now tries to say that they're center-right. Uh, I think Newsmax from the beginning has been center-right um, and that we are not extreme, we're not right-wing, we're conservative in a traditional sense. I always say we're independent, but we have a conservative perspective. I think if you look at the Fox hosts at night, uh, Tucker, Hannity, and Laura, they're far more conservative than our hosts. You know, Greg Kelly, I think, is a moderate conservative, Rob Schmidt, um, and Grant Stinchfield. Um, but they're, they're, they're conservative, but they're more traditional in their approach. And we're certainly, Newsmax.com has always been open to liberal voices. Uh, another sign, I think, we're not grabbing that right-wing mantle. We're not here to just push a political ideology or a political party but to give people information with a certain perspective. When you say, you know, historically what's considered traditional uh, conservative thinking, uh, where, what does that mean? Tell me what that means. Well, I think traditional conservatives believe in uh, uh, limited government, a strong mm -hmm. military defense, um, and uh, a strong a strong social values, belief in, in the, the power of uh, religious faith in our, in our society and those type of things. So I think those are the types of issues that our viewers would like us to address and look at, issues that impact those areas. Uh, where I think a traditional conservative media outlet would be, would be one that would, would not only look at those values and report on them, stories that impact those areas, but also seek out voices that would be contradictory or give opposing views. You know, Bill Buckley always said that, he said, conservatives don't need to have just a conservative news channel or outlet. They just need balance and to have both sides because the public will usually 80% of the time pick the conservative side when they're given an equal disposition of both sides. And I think that Newsmax tries to do that. We try to give both sides and 
and let people decide themselves. Yeah, unless they live in New York or California. That works for the rest of the country except those two states. <laughs> or if you give them the equal sides, they'll pick the left side. It's just, uh, uh, just uh, amazing. Well, thing. what's happened, though, Charles, is in those states and the larger culture, they don't want to even allow to have two sides. They're so afraid of two sides. Look at CNN and MSNBC. 80% of their contributors, I saw a statistic, 80% of their Republican contributors endorsed Joe Biden in the last election. Now, that's totally out of step. We know in the exit polls, over 90% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump. So the, there was no real internal division within the Republican Party, despite if you watched uh, the left networks, you would have thought there was this huge internal division on the Republican side over Donald Trump, but there really wasn't. Uh, he had almost near unanimous support in the party. Well, where do you see where do you see the media going in terms of reporting about the news in the next presidential election? A lot of mistakes made. Uh, a lot of the public being extremely skeptical of traditional media outsources. Where do you see, Chris? Because you've been ahead of the curve this whole time. Where do you see the media heading in the next four years? Well, I think we're in a dangerous place, Charles, because of the effort to deplatform, delegitimatize, and uh, isolate and demean media that the, the, the liberal establishment media doesn't agree with. I don't even know if I'd call them liberal anymore. Uh, I think the fact that big tech closed down the former president of the United States and took him off Twitter, took him off Facebook. These are very dark moments in our history. Uh, traditional liberals would not have espoused this 20 or 30 years ago. And the cancel culture and the rise of it is um, very, very disturbing. And I do think it really brings home the importance that all of us have to have in multiple media, multiple channels and platforms for media, that we can't really rely on just one avenue to get our news or information or that it be disseminated that way. Um, and the more, the more there are, the better. And so I think that should be, I think, an area that we all look at and, and see how we can, you know, I look at it from a business perspective, but individuals should make sure they're getting their information from more than one way. I think so, podcasts are terrific. I love you for saying that, and thanks for being on. But I, I'm asking you this question. I, 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 list, I watch Newsmax. What is my other media that I should be looking at? Well, I'm, I'm in favor of you looking at all media, uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of sources for conservatives out there to go to. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to name them, but you could name them. There's the Daily Wire. There's the Blaze. There's Breitbart. Um, there's Fox News. There's a lot of different sources out there. Um, I also think it's important to see what the, the liberal side is doing and what the leftist side is doing and going and checking out their media. We're finding that, according to the Nielsen data, about 30% of our viewers on television are Democrats. Another 30% approximately declare themselves as independents. And about a third are identified as Republicans. I like that. I like that we're being checked out by the Democrats. They may not be agreeing with us, but I think it's really healthy that they're looking at the other side. I think it's healthy for conservatives to check out other liberal TV channels, for instance. As a news source, if I wanted to do that, I, I love Newsmax, watch it. Who would be the, the, the liberal side or the left side that, I, that you feel is credible today that you would want to, that you would suggest I check out for a more balanced view? I don't know if there is any liberal site that is, is considered the more balanced view. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say there's one liberal site that I think, you know, is more balanced. I think the New York Times is somewhat restrained in their le leftism. They, they're a little more careful than the Washington Post, which seems to be a little more aggressively left these days. Uh, and then, and then, you know, if you go to MSNBC or ABC, the TV networks have gone completely off the rails. Uh, you know, they're in their left way. The Daily Beast, I can't even, they just, they just, there's so many things in there that really they're almost like the epitome of fake news. They just, they just make things up almost. It's just unbelievable some of the things that they post.
And uh, no, no, I think they could. Yeah, I think they could have been a source of like interesting, innovative information, um, but they're not. See, you go back to that. That's, a, that's an excellent point. When you, we back in the day, I do remember looking at the Drudge Report at the same time. I think this was two of two thousand five, uh, maybe earlier. This is during Clinton. The Drudge Report used to come out. The very simple banner on his site and outstanding stuff that he used to post there. And then you came around in ninety eight. But I remember reading you back in the early two thousands. Uh, the the my concern is, and I read the Wall Street Journal. I get the New York Post for the past. 30, 40 years. Uh, my concern is this. Who do you, who's putting out the fake information and who's putting out the real information? Because sometimes, even as an educated person who reads a lot and tries to, it sometimes gets very blurry. You know, also a publication is, is not like a, a monolithic thing. There's like dozens of reporters and publishers there so I think you've got to pick and choose and, and look for information in different sources. For instance, Bill Gertz at the Washington Times is one of the best national security reporters in the United States. He should be, by all rights, like at the New York Times, let's say, the, if it was the newspaper of record. But he isn't. He's at the Washington Times. And anything he writes about, I take as very credible. You know, he was the guy early on that said that the U.S. government had concerns that the, the, the virus came from the Wuhan laboratory. And over time, other intelligence has supported that. Um, but he had some of the earliest stories on that, and he tends to be ahead of the curve. Um, so I look sometimes more at the individual uh, than I do at at necessarily, you know, the, 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 the main publication. Sometimes you have to do that. Um, so there, there are different reporters that we'll look at. How serious do you think, let me rephrase that question to you. Uh, the fact that a, a president, when he was pres ex-president, can be booted off the airwaves, off Twitter, and the concern that many Americans have now is the clamping down of free speech, these Facebook, Google, Twitter, they have become media outlets. Agreed? Uh, who's policing them? Well, they got these 230 protections and they don't get sued like other media companies because they say they're just open platforms. They're that not they're open not platforms, innovative. right. And they are actually going in and actively editing and and um rating information and saying certain information is inaccurate or not or that are identifying and bracketing information i think they're an editor and they should be held responsible and not get an exemption i don't have the exemption you don't have the exemption i don't think they should have the exemption i think it actually would mean they would have to be more careful about what they reported either they have to truly be a forum and be, ex and be eligible for the 230 exemption, or they would have to hire people to review their stuff and not post stuff that would be defamatory and libelous and things like that. Chris, could you please explain to my listeners what the 230 was, is? Well, basically, this is a uh, law back in the 90s, I believe it was. I'm not a lawyer, but it allows uh, companies that are um, hosting chat rooms, discussion rooms, open forums, social media, to not be responsible for the content that they post, that is posted in their forums and not be subject to lawsuits. And because otherwise there was so much information coming through those pipes, so to speak, that it would be very hard for any one company to monitor and edit those and carefully uh, aggregate them. And so it, get, it on one hand, it, it gave them a tremendous advantage of, because they could aggregate content and not do it in a necessarily a responsible way, but and get huge amounts of people participating in that content, but never be held to the same standards as a regular media organization um, which is very expensive to put together journalism. But they really are media outlets. Anyway, by all definition, that's what they're doing. 
Well, they have quasi done it by by taking in and stepping in and starting to saying this one's true and this one's right. false. Right. This one can publish and this one can't be published. Uh, looks like the Trump administration sort of caught wind of this late and they really only started trying to move aggressively. Um, and it's interesting because the big tech companies really tried to cl- really clamp down after the election. And there's a view that they are monopolies. And interestingly enough, the Biden administration and Biden has associated himself and the Democrats with people that don't like these big monopolies and would like to break them up in some way, which I actually agree with. I think uh, they're monopolies and that they should not they should be subject to uh, more competition. And uh, that they're trying to curry favor by going after Trump and other Republican sources and closing them out uh, as a last minute effort to do that could be true. It certainly seems like a lot of this was done after the election uh, than before. I just wonder what breakups eventually do. Like, for example, how would you break up Google where most of the majority of the business is search? How would that even if you break it up, what actually happens? Oh, there's a lot of ways. Um, there's different ways they, on the, on the search advertising, they have huge control over advertising. So you can break up how they do the advertising. The fact that they also close, they also control the largest video content provider, YouTube, uh, could be, YouTube could be broken out as a separate company. So you don't have the synergies and the anti-competition activities of both of those companies working together. You know, I, 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 maybe, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not uh, well-versed in this to, to uh, carry on further, but I just remember with AT&T being split up and now you split up AT&T into all the little baby bells and now all the baby bells started to come back together again. <laughs> so it's more things change and more they uh, remain the same. I just don't know how that'll play out. Well, I think we should all argue for competition. And I don't think uh, we're a, a laissez-faire approach to businesses that control so much of our economic activity on the internet, you know, you have two country, two companies that basically control all advertising on the internet, Google and Facebook. I think there's a problem with that and a lack and, and it limits competition. So government, I think plays a legitimate role in breaking up competition or promoting competition in those, in those environments. And I think competition is key to the free enterprise system. Yeah. Just amazing. It's such a short in of time, what they've done. Last question for you, Chris, is where do you see Newsmax in the next three to four years? Well, I think we're going to become a dominant player in, in cable news and OTT news, and I combine them in one area. You know, Even if we don't necessarily beat Fox in the cable world, uh, our growth in the cable world, coupled with what we're doing online, where people can get us on all these apps and on their smart TVs and Pluto and Roku, it's going to make Newsmax one of the most dominant players in television news. And that, I think, is is happening and well underway. And we, we don't have really much competition in that area. And I think it's going to be, uh, in the next two or three years, are going to be really good. And I think the public, with a Biden administration, where the media has been so sympathetic to him, we're going to play an important role of being... Um, um, loyal opposition, which is what I said back in November, Newsmax was going to be uh, after the uh, election, and uh, we will continue to do that. Wow, outstanding! Chris Ruddy, CEO, founder, co-founder of founder or co-founder? I'm the founder. The founder of Newsmax. You're the guy who put it all together in 1998 with twenty five thousand dollars. That was the initial investment. Yes. Where'd you get that from? Well, I got it from a friend's family on Long Island, and um, and the, they were very kind to invest. And then I went on to raise uh, some significant capital. But it did, uh, it did, it was the early investors that uh, played a very key role. You know, it, it, I look back to my whole success started with loans. I needed twelve thousand five hundred dollars to rent a seat and have enough money in my uh, trading account when I became a floor trader in the New York Stock Futures Exchange, which was connected with the stock exchange. And that twelve thousand five hundred was everything. That was that was it. Without that initial, uh, uh, without that initial investment, life would have been a lot different. Charles, I think you're still a good investment. So, <laughs> love it, Chris. I mean, next time I've, I've, you come, I should have came to you. You would have gave me the whole thing in one swoop. That would have been a good deal, huh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. It's Chris Ruddy, thank thanks so much. Continued success to you. Outstanding and. Uh, 
Uh, Newsmax, I just hope it continues to grow and grow. You're doing a fantastic job. You and your team well, are doing just amazing, amazing job. And great success to you and your podcast. It's really important we have these independent voices out there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.